All right, hello everyone. My name is Hannah Knorr, and I'm a first year medical student at the University of Central Florida College of Medicine. And I'm also a critical thinking fellow at the Ion Hirsi Ali Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that works to protect women from honor violence, genital mutilation, and forced marriage with an overall emphasis on liberty for all. The Ion Hirsi Ali Foundation specifically aims to advance freedoms both in the United States and around the world, which as a critical think thinking fellow, I help facilitate. Now for today's event, we are in an age where differing opinions are often equated with ill intent. An age where extreme polarization has stripped us of civil discourse. In today's event on how to have impossible conversations, we will be, we will be working to bridge the moral divide and rekindle the art of civil discourse. Today's speaker is Peter Bogosian. Peter is a founding faculty member at the University of Austin and the director of the National Progress Alliance. He has a teaching pedigree spanning more than 25 years that focuses on the Socratic method, scientific skepticism, and critical thinking. His dissertation explored increasing the moral reasoning of prison inmates and aiding their desistance from crime. His most recent book, How to Have Impossible Conversations, and his most recent writing can be found in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Scientific American, Time, Mag Time Magazine, National Review, and elsewhere. His work is centered on the tools, on bringing the tools of professional philosophers to a wide variety of contexts to help people think through what seems to be intractable problems. Without further ado, Peter Bogosian. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. I, I appreciate it. Uh, I, I know that there could be other things you're doing tonight. So hopefully I'll, we'll have some fun. I, I tweeted out something, let's see, <laughs> on, uh, every time I look at this, it still makes me laugh. On February 7th, I tweeted out, whether you agree with him or not, Biden is on point, sharp, funny, period. Shows that the senility slash dementia talk is BS. Within one minute of me tweeting that out, I received an onslaught of hate. Uh, my Twitter feed was filled with people calling me every, <laughs> every conceivable <clears throat> manner of nastiness. And within two minutes, people, <laughs> very good friends of mine, would text me things like, uh, well, uh, one of my friends texted me on, uh, tw tweeted at me. He said, uh, have, you, have you been drunk tweeting? And a very, one of my best friends <laughs> texted me, Dude, what the f um, so, <laughs> so it seems that, so, so when I watched that talk, I thought that Biden was actually just that. I thought that independent of the policies, I thought that he was sharp. I thought that it was a good talk. He engaged with people. Uh, and I had been hearing so much talk that he was a, a blithering, drooling fool that I thought that that countered that narrative extraordinarily well. But there's something about audience capture and there's something about <clears throat> a kind of tribalism that we see in our society now that you can't say you can't say a positive thing about someone if you're perceived on being across the aisle or on the other side of divide and we have to stop that we have to change that if we want to have civil discourse and not turn into another Iraq then we have to take some steps to change that so tonight Here's the plan for tonight. Here's what we're gonna do. So uh, I'm gonna give a brief talk. Usually these are an hour, but I'm gonna shorten it to 20, 20 or 30 minutes, depending. And then I'm gonna do, uh, this is called Spectrum Street Epistemology. Street Epistemology, come on in, plenty of seats, plenty of seats, come on in. Uh, it's from my, my book in uh, 2013. I'm gonna show you how to calibrate your beliefs to the evidence and to speak across divides. Normally what we would do if we had more time is I'd run you through a process to show, to show you how to collaborate on various topics, but we literally just had the room and we were rushed in so we couldn't do that. So uh, we're gonna take the claims in the back. So, so if you want, you can just get up and write on the board any claims you want and then we're gonna do this. So I'm gonna give you the method and the model for what we're gonna do here. One of the most difficult things when you speak across a divide or someone with whom you have a, a substantive disagreement is that you think 
you know what they're talking about, but you actually don't know what they're talking about. This is an extraordinarily easy problem to get around. All you need to do is to say, is to put the burden of understanding on yourself. So this is the strongly disagree line. So I'll stand over here. Is to put, or I'll stand on the disagree line. Is to put the burden of understanding on yourself. So I think I understand this, but let me make sure I understand. Not you were unclear, not the message wasn't conveyed well, but put the burden of understanding on yourself, okay. And then what you wanna do is, you wanna repeat that back to somebody. And you wanna say, is this, do I have this correct? Notice how I put the burden of understanding on myself. Do I have this correct? In the ideal world from uh, hostage negotiations, hostage negotiators look for two words. They look for that's right. If you ever ask someone a question and they say that's right, boom, you got it, you nailed it. Now, that won't happen very often. People will say yes, good enough, or yes. If they say no, then watch the framing. All of these words are parsed out in the literature. I talk about this in my book. Um, say, okay, all right, thank you. What am I not getting? What, what don't I understand? And then ask them to do it again and then repeat back again what, what you heard. So it is, it might seem like it's a little laborious, but it's truly the most important thing when you speak across the divide. In fact, people have written entire books about how to listen and how to actively listen. Okay. So let's say that they say to you, yes, that's, that's what I mean. Or you have that right or what have you. So in this case, people will be standing on, it's like a Likert scale. People will be standing on a line whether they agree with the proposition. Most of the time when you speak to someone who has a different opinion, you have your opinion and they have their opinion and you're each delivering messages to each other. The literature is pretty clear on this, although it's not crystal clear. It's clear enough that we can say that providing facts and evidence isn't enough to sway someone, particularly as the ideas uh, spill into the moral domain. So, so, so you, you have a situation, you've now understood, you're asking people why they believe something, or you're about to ask someone why they believe something, but what you don't wanna do is you don't want to start with your opinion first, you wanna ask them why they believe it. Now, this may seem obvious, and in, to an extent there is, but there's a danger there. If I'm on the agree line, if someone is on the agree line and I ask them why they believe something, the vast majority of people, particularly if you agreed to come down and play the, the thought game in the first place, are gonna tell you why they agree. The problem with that is that they will raise their confidence in their beliefs because they hear themselves articulate their own reasons to, them, to, to themselves. So I know that this is a kind of a, heres a heresy, if you will, to the professors in the back. I know this is kind of a heresy, but think about it like this. Instead of saying, why do you believe that? Here's an, another alternative question that I, that I ask everybody. All these games are the same, and at the end of the evening, I'm gonna have people do exactly what I do, so pay attention. I will say every time, what would convince you, what evidence, reason, or argument would convince you to move one line to the right or one line to the left? In other words, you're not asking someone why they believe something, you're asking them what would it, it kind of a disconfirmation question, what would it take to disconfirm your belief? Most people live their entire lives, they never ask this question. They're simply never asked it. Scientists are somewhat trained to a certain extent when you test hypotheses, et cetera. My own belief is that this should be asked to literally everybody as the foundation of K-12 education. Why do you believe it? What would it take to change your mind? Let's talk about what the evidence is for that. Okay. So there are only so many things that people can say to this. They, so usually, usually but not always, you'll get the response if someone stands on the strongly agree or if they stand on the strongly disagree line. Not always, certainly not always, but the mode, more often than not, they'll say nothing, nothing. There's literally nothing you can say that would move me to the disagree line. Okay, 
So that's one thing we have. You, you will get that if, when people stand other places as well, but it's just more common when people take an extreme stance. The other thing that people can say to you is, uh, well, they'll give you a piece of evidence. This is the kind of evidence I, I would need to change your mind. So evidence. The third thing people can say to you is, geez, I, I really don't know. I have no idea what it would take me to change my mind. And most of the time people will say that because no one's ever asked them that before. They always ask them why they believe, not what would it take to change your mind. The response I always give when someone says, I don't know, is that's a great answer. I don't know is always a great answer. That way that people don't pretend to know something they don't know. And in classes when you teach, uh, I always make it a point to say I don't know something when I don't know something. Okay, the final thing someone can say is they can give you a wild, wildly disconfirmable statement. Like, um, um, so, you know, something like the, the, the famous uh, uh, example is, how do you know, what would it take for you to not believe Jesus died for your sins? And the uh, 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 quintessential example for that is the bones of Christ. Because if he had the bones of Christ, then Jesus wouldn't have resurrected and gone to heaven. So the bones of Christ would be a disconfirming, um, an instance of a disconfirmation statement. However, there's no possible way I could provide someone with the bones of Christ. That's just, that's ludicrous. Uh, but, but it is something that someone can say. So only four things that people can say about this. Okay. So now let's go back and center it on the game. <clears throat> so there are, people are on the neutral line. We've gone all around the world and done this, and we're about to go to, just got back from Puerto Rico. We're about, come on in, guys, plenty of room. Oh, this is my jiu-jitsu coach. Hey, coach. This man is a black belt in jiu-jitsu. So is he. Is he really a black belt in jiu-jitsu too? Hey, coach. Uh, come on in, plenty of room. Okay, so... Um, so here's, he, so, so here's one of the things when you do this long enough with enough questions, here's one of the things that you realize after you've done this a significant period of time. People will stand on a particular line, not necessarily because they have evidence for standing on a line, but because that's the line they think they should be standing on. Let me, let me repeat that because that's, that's really important. People do not formulate their beliefs for epistemological reasons. They form, in other words, they do not formulate their beliefs on the basis of evidence for, and then examine how they know something as a reflection of that evidence. They formulate their beliefs on the basis of what it means to them to be a good person. So here's the syllogism. I am a good person. Good people believe X. I believe X. When you truly drill down on this game, the overwhelming majority of times people will, when you really drill down, like you have someone on, on this and you're just asking them polite questions for 10, 15, 20 minutes, at base is um, a kind of moral motivation for standing on a particular, for calibrating their belief to a certain degree. And they, it won't be necessarily evidence that will move them like I don't know or this kind of evidence, it will be a conception of self. And it will also be a community. Because when you change your belief, when you go from line to line, one of the dangers of that is that you will lose the moral community. James Lindsay and I call that an ideologically motivated moral community. Uh, in other words, you're ideologically motivated to hold certain beliefs because people in your community hold them. And when you, like if you look at the literature on cult exiting, uh, one of the reasons people don't uh, leave cults or are afraid to leave cults is because they leave their communities behind. Similarly, uh, Mike Werner told me something. He did a study on um, uh, religious membership and particular religious affiliations. And he said that, uh, I can't remember the exact statistic, but it's a certain number of friends over a certain period of time. The, I mean, the time I remember, I don't remember the number of friends, but over six months, I also haven't read the study. But the idea is that you develop a community of people and those, the community of people in religious, a, a religious context hold a certain belief. And so you would calibrate what line you're on according to the belief. There's one more piece of that. 
Um, and it's this idea that you would leave the tribe. In uh, Jehovah's Witnesses call it disfellowshipping. Um, you, you would somehow, uh, Scientologists call it, uh, you'd be a squirrel, you know, you leave the faith. There's something about leaving your community when you repudiate the belief system. Okay, is this clear so far? Everybody clear? Okay, so let's, let's cycle this back and bring it to the, back to the game, and we'll do a quick review, and I'll throw out some, some more things. So um, everybody starts on the neutral line. So here are the rules of the game. Everybody will start on the neutral line. I'll read the claim, which Reed is currently writing up. Uh, most of these we made up or people filled it out as we, we came in. So there's no like, there's, there's no gotcha claims or anything. They're all whatever people want to talk about. Mostly l- lately it's been aliens and marijuana. Um, so, so we'll do the claim and I'll read it and then I'll count down five, four, three, two, one, move. And it's very important that everybody move when I say move. And the reason for that is we don't want the person in the front to influence the people in the back. We want everyone to make their own independent decision of where they want to move. And the only other rule of the game is you have to commit to a line. So if you kind of a little change your mind, that doesn't work. Nor can you do this. Nor if you agree more than strongly can you you step off of the off out of the game field. So the game is very simple. And now I want to tell you a few things what I hope people get out of this tonight. If you ever work with anybody, if you ever teach, if you ever work with kids, if you want to help them develop their thinking abilities, this game is ideal. Anybody can do it and it's completely free. Uh, Reed is the president of Street Epistemology International. It's a nonprofit. I have a nonprofit. One of the goals of my nonprofit is to help people communicate more civilly. This isn't proprietary. Anybody can use it. Literally anybody can do it. We've seen this done. People have done this at ta- town hall meetings when they want to select uh, c- candidates to see why the candidates believe what they do and how they differ on issues. So literally anybody can, can use this. Okay, so let's, let's take a step back and situate what I said in the game. So start on the neutral line. Count down from five, you move. I ask you uh, why you believe it. Ideally, someone would be on a different line. And then I would ask them, uh, I'll ask you at some point, what would it take you to move to the left? What would it take you to move to the right? If someone is on another line, I'll ask them if they can provide that information. Um, If we don't have someone within within a line, we can help, it's more difficult, but you can help calibrate um, people, they're called disconfirmation questions in philosophy, called the feasibility questions, or how do you disconfirm the belief? Um, uh, I'll always put the burden of understanding on myself. There's no gotcha questions, there's no trick questions. It's incredibly straightforward. Okay, so let's take a pause. How's everybody doing? Good. Is this clear so far? All right, Reed, how are we doing in terms of time? Okay. Do we have time for Delphi technique or no? Good, let me read those, let me read these out in case folks can't see them. Toxic masculinity is a big problem. Rejecting one's biological sex is natu- naturally detrimental to one's mental health. There is an objective standard of art and beauty. God is the only objective criteria for truth. DEI departments should be abolished at UCF. Wokeness has gone too far. Reality is a simulation. We are being visited by aliens every time that manages to get on there. Isn't it funny how that works? Every time. Um, All cultures have equal moral worth. UFC is systematically racist. Some people are born in the wrong body. It's okay for drag queens to perform for children. Nothing controversial about this list. Um, Transgenderism is a social contagion. Equity is a worthy goal. Americans blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. I should say, why don't we comp- compose a list of one, two, three, uh, five, five, three, fifteen. Why don't we compose a list of fifteen things nobody should t- be able to talk about except the aliens one. All right. So this is a little technique. I use this all the time. I published a paper about this a few years ago. Uh, this is a way to build community consensus among people who ordinarily wouldn't agree. Uh, it's a version of this thing called the Delphi technique. It's pretty cool. You can use this if you're a professor. You can use. I used to use this in my classes for the, what questions would be on the exam. It's, I used to use it in prisons. It's pretty cool. Okay, so what we're going to do is 
we'll do a few iterations of this. Uh, there are about, I don't know how many people there are here, but, um, and then we'll take votes. Uh, in this first round, everybody will get two votes. The questions that will remain, we will then play the game with the highest ranked questions. So first iteration, everybody gets two votes of the things you want to talk about. So this is an honor system, only two votes. Okay. Not that you agree with it, yeah, not that you agree with it, but you just want to see it play out across the spectrum. Okay, who wants to see this conversation topic? Toxic masculinity is a big problem. Zero. Rejecting one's biological sex is nat naturally detrimental to one's mental health. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. There's an objective standard of art and beauty. One. That's okay, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Uh, God is the only objective criteria for truth. One, two, three, four, five. Is that a hand? Five, sh sh hold on, everybody up again. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. Uh, DEI department should be abolished at UFC, uh, UCF. UFC, see there I go again, UFC, I'm thinking ultimate fine challenge. One, two, three, four. Wokeness has gone too far. That was the uh, Oxford debate thing with uh, Chris uh, Kissin and Lindsay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven. Reality is a simulation. One, two. <laughs> Well, you strongly, you would strongly agree. Uh, we are being visited by aliens. One, one. Uh, all cultures have moral worth. Equal moral worth. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. U UCF is systematically racist. One, two, two. Some people are born in the wrong body. Zero. It's okay for drag queens to perform for children. Zero. Transgenderism is a social contagion. One. Equity is a worthy goal. Two. Americans blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Look, he didn't even, he didn't even vote for his own. Uh, <laughs> Two, two. Okay, so uh, this is this is how you do it. So there's no there's no uh, set prescription for what comes next. This is basically how you do it. So th so immediately we can eliminate anything with a zero because nobody wants to do it. But the next cutoff would point would also be a one. Let's do let's do the zeros and ones before you do twos. So that put that two back. Okay, so this is what we're left with now. Um, now you have to make a decision whether or not you want to do the twos. Does it hurt to do the twos? No, but they probably won't get that many votes. So you have a choice. We could do three iterations or we can do two. Now only because we don't have a ton of time, I'm just gonna do one more iteration. And as a general rule, when you do this to build consensus, when you first start, give people multiple votes and then shave one off each time. Like what technique do you want to do? You want to do a Kimura? You could do this and that. Okay, so let, let's dump the twos. Let's dump the twos. Unless anybody has a passion for keeping the twos. Anybody like gung-ho? You, you want to keep the twos? Well, one of the Which one of the twos do you want to keep? Equity is a worthy goal. All right, we'll keep that. Anybody else want to keep one of the twos? All right, let's keep all the twos, keep all the twos. <laughs> keep all the twos, keep all the twos. All right, now we're gonna reset these again, uh, but when you reset them, you reset them back to zero, the tallies aren't cumulative, okay. So this time, everybody's gonna get one vote, and then we're gonna use, in order, we're gonna rank order these and do these. So depending on how much time we'll have, we'll either do two of these or three of these, and at the end of the night, uh, one of you is going to do this, is going to facilitate the exercise. Okay. 
So re one vote, honor system. Rejecting one's biological sex is naturally detrimental to one's mental health. Three, all cultures have equal moral worth. <laughs> Eight, UFC is systematically racist. You <laughs> You, you, <laughs> oh my God, okay. UCF. UCF, UCF, UCF. I watch way too much fighting. You've been here 13 years and sometimes I still do. Okay, I just, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to get my black belt right now. That's all I'm thinking. I watch, that's all my YouTube videos I watch are about jujitsu. Okay, UCF is systematically racist. Zero, okay. So we already know this is not gonna be discussed, right? We already know it's a zero. Uh, God is the only objective criteria for truth. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six, uh, I forgot to mention it, but the camera guys, secretaries, anything when I do this in the prisons, like the, the secretaries give, everybody gets a vote here. DEI department should be abolished at UCF. Okay, one, two, three, Four, four. Wokeness has gone too far. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Reality is a simulation. One, two, two. Equity is a worthy goal. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, Americans blew up the Nord Stream pipeline. Zero, okay. All right, so dump the zeros. Everybody in, needs a read in their life. Okay. Okay, now can you read, can you place those in, in order just for, all right, so the first one we're gonna do is that one and then the seven one, okay. so. Uh, the ideal number of people is four. So one of the things, okay, so let me just say one more thing about this. We're constantly changing, evolving, mixing this up, testing it, see what, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, uh, and, and making an accommodation that way. One of the things that we've changed about this since we've started is we'll do fewer people to start and then if everybody goes to one line, I'll ask if, if there's someone who sincerely disagrees and then we'll populate the line that way. It's just much easier when you speak across a divide. But we just started that. We just came up with that over, over dinner a couple nights ago. Okay, so who would like to volunteer, raise your hand for all cultures have equal moral worth? One, two, three, come on down, come on down. Okay, so you stand on the neutral line at the end. You just hear it, neutral line at the end, face this way, and you stand in the front, and you stand there. Uh, the reason I put them that way is it goes by height, and it's just, it's a camera thing, it's not a discriminatory thing. Just like this? Yeah, just like that. Okay, so let me just review the rules real quick. Um, you can move lines at any point, you just have to commit to a full line, so you can't do that. and. Uh, Wait, I'm gonna count down from five, four, three, two, one, and I'm gonna say move. And if you ever uh, forget the, the claim, I'm gonna repeat it a lot, but um, uh, it will be on the board. Now, for everybody in the audience, one of the things that I want you to do, it, it gets a little tricky to keep this stuff in your head, but Reed is gonna be typing on the board claims that people make and reasoning for the claims and you can trace the reasoning. And remember what the objective of this is. The objective is to see if the lines people are on are the lines they ought to be on according to their own reasoning. That's the objective. Everybody got it? Is that clear? Okay. All right, so we're gonna do the claim. All cultures have equal moral worth. Don't move until I say move. Five, four, three, two, one, move. Okay. <laughs> Okay, 
This is almost the worst case scenario, but that's okay. <laughs> Does anybody sincerely, uh, does anybody have the sincere belief that they strongly agree or uh, agree? Uh, yeah, agree. Okay, well, that's okay. <laughs> we can still do it. Okay, tell us why. Oh, and uh, we're, we're tra Travis, so I need this. Okay, cool, cool. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, tell us why you strongly agree that all cultures have equal moral worth. So I think when you go to a moral relativist system and you try and prescribe some form of morality to every single culture, you have to, and, and eventually you're going to have to start making excuses or turning a blind eye to do some pretty heinous uh, actions that certain cultures uh, commit. So you, let me, see, let me see. Okay, so now I'm going to repeat back to him. So the reason you believe the reason you strongly disagree that all cultures have equal moral worth is that when some cultures do certain things that are considered, g give it to me one more time. Give it to me one more time. So when you go to moral relativ relativism, where you try and say we should respect the morality of how certain different cultures um, function, you're going to eventually run into a situation where you're going to have to cover for some pretty heinous moral things that certain cultures do. Okay. So... There, you believe a, a moral judgment can be made about certain actions in certain cultures? Correct. Okay. So I got that right? Yes. Okay, so do you see, I, now that he said correct, only then do I move to the next person. Because remember, someone's going to have to do this by the end of the night. Okay. So tell us why you disagree. I think put most simply, since all cultures don't have the same moral systems, they can't all be morally equivalent. Since all cultures don't have the same moral systems, they can't be morally equivalent, but they could be morally relative. Um, well, everything is relative to something else. I don't know what you mean by that statement. Well, you can't be both um, morally relative and morally equivalent. Can you define what morally relevant means in this context? Um, well, I was thinking, I was kind of riffing off of what he, what he was saying when he mentioned relativism. If, if a culture is relative, if morality is relative, then there's, there'd be no way for cultures to be equal because, they're, because there's no stand. In order to say they're equal, there has to be some standard. Yes, there has to be. Um, yeah, in order to judge anything, there has to be a standard by which it's judged off of. Um, so even... Everything's relative to something, so it, in this situation, it'd be relative to the standard. Okay, cool. Can you tell us why all cultures have equal moral worth? I, why I disagree with? Yeah, why, why you disagree? Um, I think, not to, I don't know if that's part of the criteria, piggyback on some of the other... No, that's fine, that's fine. There is no right or wrong. Uh, that relative, you know, just relative, relativism, you know, goes to some pretty heinous places, and if I had to kind of... Define why I disagree, um, try to be put simply, is like just the results. You know, it's kind of impossible for me to say they have equal moral worth when, um, you know, some of them just have just so, so, so much different results. And, um, you know, regardless of what the, those morals are, there are some that are, um, you know, we, we, most people share in the civilized or I don't even know if that's the right term, but, you know, uh, infanticide. There's right, certain right. things that across the board, it's like, there are some cultures that they condone that, and then um, you know I can't say they're they're equally morally. Okay. But I also think you can learn from even the most reprehensible culture. Okay. There's something we can learn from there. So that's why I'm not. Okay, cool. So this is, this is so normally I wouldn't keep going back to the audience, but I just want to explain to you what what's going through my mind when I do this. So um, we have there are two choices that I have now. Uh, I can ask, what would it take you to disagree? And then I can come here and I can say, what would it take you to move one line to the slightly agree or one line to the strongly agree? And then I can ask if they're confident that the line that they're on is the line they should be on. And if you ever want to test yourself on this, there are two questions that you'll ask people at the end. One question is, uh, should I have asked you something that I didn't? Did I leave something out? But the most important question you can ask somebody, especially if it's, you feel it's not going well, is what line do you think I'd be on? 
and then you walk to the line you're on. Because it, if you say what line, in an ideal situation, they'd say all over the place. Or they'd, they'd say what line you absolutely would not be on. So when you do this, you have to maintain your neutrality as much as possible. Okay. This is what I'm going to do this time. I'm going to reset this claim since everybody is on the same line. So you guys walk back to the neutral. And I'm going to reset the claim from all cultures have equal moral worth to some claim that he mentioned in the beginning about moral relativism. Uh, and I think I'll use the claim, morality is relative, uh, all, all morality is relative to culture. Okay? Does everybody understand, like, why I did that? Uh, when people are on the same line, it's just not as, it, 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 it's not as challenging for them. The most challenging thing is when somebody is on opposite lines and they're pressing them. And then you're, you're moderating it, so I'm moderating it, so nobody goes, you can minimize the likelihood that someone's going to go crazy. Okay. So, all morality is relative to culture. Five, four, three, two, one, move. Or you don't have to move. You can stay at neutral. Do you need another second? In other words, there's no objective right or wrong. It's just whatever the culture says. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you're no, no cheating, no cheating. Okay, so you strongly disagree that all morality is relative to culture. Tell us why. Tell him why, particularly. Okay. Um, I think there are uh, objective standards of morality, and so if a culture violates those standards, then I would say they're less moral. How do you know that there are objective standards of morality? Well, um, I pull mine from my faith, and I would uh, like to think that the standards I use are the correct ones. If your faith was false, would all morality still be relative to culture? Well, um, if there's no standard, then there, I suppose, is no morality. So if I was false, then hopefully someone else would be correct, and that standard would be correct. If so not, then... Uh, there's not really much point to existing on this earth, is there? Okay. Uh, tell, tell them why you disagree that all morality is relative to culture. Uh, because I believe that there are certain things that transcend cultures that need to be set as a moral standard, particularly negative rights, which are rights that government cannot take away from you, that are innate to human beings, I think some of which are enumerated in our Constitution, such as uh, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, uh, Second Amendment to defend oneself and property, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Okay. How, how, okay, so all morality of relative culture, how did you come up with those rights? Um, so I, I, one, to, uh, just to, I think you need, before you set an objective standard for what morals are, you must look at all cultures first and you see what things transcend the ones that continuously have positive human progress. Uh, and that's where I kind of transcribe mine from. Uh, would that be circular because how you def how one could define progress would depend upon the standards that you invoked? I guess it could be interpreted as circular. Um, so possibly, I would say. Is there a way to rationally derive the fact that, uh, so if, if you, you're in the disagree that all mor morality is relative to culture, is there a way to rationally derive your view? In terms of one that I can personally uh, enumerate in a way that sounds logical, I can't at the moment. Um, I believe that studying of those who came before, especially the Enlightenment era thinkers, is a good way to chip away at it. But I personally, if I had to sit here and try and rationalize it myself, I don't think I'd do a good job at it. Okay, so if you don't think you'd do a good job at it, then why are you on the disagree as opposed to the slightly disagree? So I think um, because the way in which others who are more intelligent to me have enumerated it, I think that they, based on the credibility, they have based on themselves on other propositions and the general information which I understand about distinct human morality that transcends cultures that I can kind of pull from the credibility I have from them, my basis understanding of what they're saying, and think to it to be true. Okay. Aren't there other people who are equally intelligent on the other side of the issue who argue for opposite things? That argue the more relative case? Yeah. 
So I, I would also, they would say that they, they, they make uh, coherent arguments. Um, I'm currently in a senior seminar with a, uh, the postmodernist one, the professor who's a postmodernist and also a relativist, right? And she very much pushes the relative thing, so I'm constantly hearing those arguments on a daily basis. And I think that when she makes these arguments of being more morally relativist and not saying one morals are, more, um, are transcending the others, some pretty heinous things kind of get like slipped by into a kind of cover for them. Um, and I just don't figure that, I don't think that's the right thing to do. Okay. Okay. So before you tell me why you slightly disagree, did anything that they per se, were you on slightly disagree before or did you move? I was from disagree that all culturals have equal worth to now I slightly agree that Morality is relative to culture, or all mora- morality. So I did move, yeah. I was on disagree. Did anything they say move you? Um, let me try to think Take your uh, time. what they actually uh, said. Um, yeah, yeah. Please look at that if that's going to help. Absolutely. Standards. God is the objective standard of morality was the argument that guy uh, on the strongly disagree made. Uh, these lights r- lead to progress, the guy on the disagree, and they are rationally drivable. Um, I wouldn't even say that I disagree with any of the, like further down on the chart, those individual statements, but going back to the, the original statement, I couldn't say that I, uh, str- I, I disagree or strongly agree with that. Um, I do uh, subscribe to a faith and a standard of morality personally. Um, and I do think ultimately like there is some objective, um, in terms of like our shared experience and then like certain things like infanticide or just, just these, these things that I don't know. Child marriage. Yeah. Yeah. That like, it really is on the fringes. I think you could say across the board in the world, even though the, the, the world does have some heinous stuff, but in terms of actual culture, but, um, I also recognize that, like, I've studied different, I subscribe to one faith, so to speak, but I've studied other ones, and I think, I do think they kind of derive sometimes at the same place. You know, there's all sorts of analogies in terms of, like, you know, we're all different parts of the elephant, but it's one right. big elephant. You know, we don't okay. really see the picture. So those individual statements, I, I, I agree with them in terms of, I guess being the disagree statement, but I do also think beyond like those certain subjects in a culture, like there is a huge spectrum and I'm willing to recognize that and okay. I can disagree with them, but, uh, you know, I don't think that, uh, I don't, it's, it's, it's a smaller list, I guess, of things that I think are just like truly objective in terms of, uh, morality. Okay. Uh, okay. As cool. Opposed to them. That's why I'm slightly okay. Real quick. Uh, and then I'm going to wrap this one up. What would it take for you to move to the from the strongly disagree to the disagree? What what evidence, reason could you have to hear? Would someone have to say to you? Um, I'm fairly confident in my position here. Um, I don't necessarily think uh, I could be moved from the concept of there being a standard. Um, I guess the only way I could move would be the standard changing. So like me agree, me prescribing to a different standard than I am currently. Um, but I do hold to the idea that there is a standard. Okay. So let me make sure I understand this. So if there's nothing, if there's no evidence, there's, so there's no evidence that would cause you to move to disagree, right? Um, well, I guess the best way to say is, um, there's no evidence that I can think of that would make me move to disagree, okay. but perhaps there's something that hasn't occurred to me. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, what would cause you to, to move to his line to strongly agree, strongly disagree, sorry? Um, I definitely think a confirmation of a, a divine being. I'm sort of kind of agnostic in my theistic beliefs. Um, not to get sidetracked, but more kind of the Aristotle on move move argument, right? But that aside, if there's a theist, if, if there can be a confirmed theistic being who is omnipotent, all powerful, who can then dish out the um, correct morals for the universe in a rationalistic way, then I would go to strongly, strongly disagree. Um, but even if that was the case, mm-hmm. you'd need to know that God wants you to do what he wants you to do. Correct. So I think there would have to be um, some sort of divine intervention for that to occur. Okay. What would it take you to move to the slightly disagree? I'm not sure, to be honest. That's a great answer. 
What what would it take for you to move one line over to the neutral? To the neutral? Oh, because like, anything he could. Uh, just, okay, <laughs> okay. Well, what what would you? Okay, then what would it take you to move to the disagree or the slight? Thing they could tell you or you could hear. To move to the right. Um, I guess the same answer, whether it's neutral or even going further down. Um, I was thinking just in terms of uh, experiences with cultures, because my experience in terms of the cultures in the world is... Puerto Rico. Yeah, Puerto Rico. Where I've lived, you know, is a very small portion of the world. So I think that could also make me go the other way. Oh, but but um, definitely more um, negative experiences with, with, with a culture might make me go to the right. Um, but it, it, it could go the other way and just to kind of in general, I guess more to strongly disagree... The more interactions I observed between cultures, if I kept seeing a definitive result uh, or a clear, you know, okay. like, hey, this is the this is the truly objective standard, then okay. I would be pushed that way. But um, okay, I, I yet got in those experiences. R- r- t- two 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 final questions. Um, in terms of your relationships with your close friends, is this question a deal breaker to you? Like, if you're a close friend, if you're cl- if you had a close friend. Standing on the strongly agree line, would would you no longer be her or his friend? It would not be a deal breaker for me. Would it be a deal breaker for you? Probably not. No. Would it be a deal breaker for you? Um, it the, in general, no. If they agree with the statement, but if I saw it expressed in certain ways, where they're just like, "Yeah, I can do whatever," okay. then then I it would be absolutely a deal breaker. If I if I don't have the same morals as somebody to the point where I think they have no morals. Okay. Um, but if they just said, I, gr- I strongly agree with the statement itself, I, I'd be like, cool. Okay, what, what line do you think I'd be on? Um, I'd say you are probably on agree or uh, strongly agree. From what I know of you and your work, I would say, <laughs> I would say slightly disagree. Okay. I just met you today. I don't know you. <laughs> so just from the questions I've asked, et cetera, where do you think I'd be? I have no clue. Okay. That means it was successful, right? Okay, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Give him a hand. Give him a hand. Uh, okay, so you see how that the uh, mapping, the arguments helps people, too? Um, what, what's amazing to me, we did a tour of the country. I can't even remember how many colleges. Nine, ten? I can't remember how many we went to. But uh, I, would a- I asked people, Dartmouth and... Berkeley, et cetera, I would always ask them a a couple of questions. Um, I would ask them, um, has anybody ever asked you what it would take to change your mind about a given proposition? And of all the people Travis and Reed and I asked, not a single person said that. So they went through four years of an Ivy education and literally nobody ever asked them that question. Flabbergasted. I was flabbergasted by that. Truly, as a, you know, the other thing in psychology that I would ask people, have any of your professors told you about the replication crisis? Not a single person said yes in all of the, I was shocked by that. Okay, moving right along. Let's do, ah, an excellent topic. <laughs> Wokeness has gone too far. Who wants to volunteer? Come on down if you want to volunteer. Let's see, one, two, Three, one, two, three. Right, we we go to three. Let's see where let's see where they let's see where they land. Let's see where they land. So you go to the neutral. Uh, you in the front this time, and you in the back. Good. Four. All right. We got four. If you haven't seen the Oxford Union debate on this, I would highly highly recommend it. It's a couple months old now. Uh, Constantine Kissin and James Lindsay's talk in particular. Okay, wokeness has gone too far. Five, four, three, two, one, move. Okay, okay. Now we're gonna do something fun. Okay, so I got a lot of variables in my head. Okay, you come to the strongly disagree line. No, 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 you go back, go back. You come to strongly disagree. You move to the slightly agree. You two move to the disagree. Ha ha. Okay. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna change the game a little bit. 
Pretend in your head <clears throat> that somebody really smart with a sincere person believes that they have good reason for standing on the line that they're on. Okay. okay? Get in your head what kind of arguments and reasoning they would have and what kind of things they would say. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to start with you since I'm standing next to you. And I know you don't agree with this. I know. Okay. So what would an intelligent, thoughtful person have to say about uh, for, for why they slightly agreed that, that wokeness, wokeness has, has gone, gone too far? far. Tell, Tell him. him. <clears throat> so we live in a society where we are cont constantly self-checking ourselves and self-checking other people by which if we're going to live in a society where it surrounds the idea of freedom, we have to allow ourselves to be free to make mistakes and to learn from experience rather than just constantly fixating ourselves or fixating other people how they live their life if we're trying to be able to live our life in a more natural way. And wokeness prevents people from living their lives in a more natural way. Indeed, because wokeness is a very broad term of many different things that happen in our society that can either be uh, trying to politically correct people based on the way they are, the way they behave, the way they live their life religiously, politically, and et cetera. So it threatens people's freedom. Excuse me? It threatens people's freedom. Indeed, yes. Okay. Why do you, why would someone who stood there, what would their argument be, tell him, what would their argument be for why, uh, for strongly disagreeing that wokeness has gone too far? Um, so first, I think it's important we define wokeness. Uh, this is how I personally do it, and if you f feel free to disagree, I define it as a mix between postmodernist philosophy and critical theory. And I, I think why in someone from this side would consider it necessary is that there have been many people who have done heinous things in the name of freedom, or propelled to be objectively supporting um, morals and freedom, and that when we try to, if, if it's tough, um, but <laughs> uh, you know, if we don't correct people from uh, from from heinously uh, causing harm to other individuals, then we will never break the cycle of violence. Okay, so tell him what someone who's standing on this line who is smart and thoughtful would say. What's an argument they would use for why they disagree that wokeness has gone too far? Mm -hmm. There is a history of discrimination within this country and many others, and uh, that discrimination's effects are still being felt today. And so it's important that we as a society acknowledge that and work to correct that. And how does wokeness correct that? Wokeness corrects that by... Uh, Increasing tolerance within the society. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so you, you're on the disagree. What would someone, a thoughtful, smart person say for why they disagree with wokeness has gone too far? Mm -hmm. I think wokeness is just an awareness that injustice exists. And by becoming more cognizant of that fact, you're better able to, uh, I guess, improve society and uh, everyone's role in that society. Okay. So this is a key question. Not did you agree with what they said, but did you understand the reasoning they have for why they're on the line they are? I agree. And I understand. I don't agree entirely, but I understand what they're coming off based on what they're explaining. Okay. Did the three of you not agree with him, but do you understand why he made the arguments he made? Yes. Like you understand his reasoning? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is the reasoning that they gave, does it align with, with the lines they're on? In other words, they gave reasons... So, some of those, or one of those is up, is up there. Um, they, they gave reasons. Do you think the reasons match the line, or should they be closer to your line based upon the reasons they gave? Are you satisfied with the reasons they gave? Personally, I think there could have been a, a more argued and more stronger reasoning, in my opinion. If that's the reasoning, then I think they should be more slightly to the degrees. 
what what reasoning would they have to have articulated for for them to be like what didn't they say that they should have said in which you'd be more comfortable that they were on the correct line? For me personally, I would be more uncomfortable with the idea that when someone mentioned about how um, it protects like the legacy of awareness, which makes sense. However, there's always going to be every good thing can also lead to a greater cost, not cost in my opinion, where it's like if you're going to aim for a goal, there could be a cost when you aim for that goal. And it's very important that we self reflect where we are as society and how we can move towards in a way that does not feel forced, but relatively natural. Because at the end of the day, we're going to need a consensus of people to understand how to go about approaching being politically correct or wokeness. But in my opinion, I don't think there is a consensus entirely on wokeness. So I think it just does not move me. Okay. All right, cool. Is there anything I should have asked that I didn't or any, anything you want to say that you think someone who would stand on that line who was intelligent and thoughtful would say? Um, I think when using a term as vague as wokeness, it would have been better to give a definition first. I agree. Yeah, it was a mistake. Yeah. So other than that, no, I think it went pretty well. Uh, any, anything you want to add of what, of what someone who was on this line would say? I, I, that's a great point that we should have defined it up front. I, I would say that wokeness by itself is divorced from things like cancel culture and outrage culture so that wokeness hasn't gone too far, but maybe the things that people tie to it are, are, or are adjacent to it, uh, are, they go too far. But wokeness by itself is not. All right. Do you have anything else? Do you want to add something? From this perspective, I think someone would like the argument, this is not done out of some type of authoritarian malice. They would say to the Platonic notion that while we may disagree, we are both trying to improve the human conditions. We just had vastly different ways of going about it. It, so, a final question. Um, if, if, if somebody is on a line other than the one, go, go back to your original lines. Yeah. It, it, if somebody were on the opposite line, would they be wrong? It, what do you mean? Like, um, here, move up for the. So let's say the, the question is wokeness has gone too far. If somebody strongly agreed, or so, excuse me, if someone strongly disagreed with that, would that opinion be wrong? Like, would there be a way to say that's wrong? Here's why. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of empirical evidence of how wokeism has gone too far, I think there's a myriad uh, of different um, ways in which one can articulate it. I think one. Great, the greatest way that we can see today is that people are actively discriminating to try and fix discrimination in the past. That's something that even Max Kennedy has said, that we must use discrimination today. To equity. Fix. Yes, the equity line. Sorry, e equity line. Yeah. Equity line. And uh, I think that's a self perpetuating uh, cycle of hate, that hate today does not fix hate in the past. Right. Okay. Um, are you, here, turn that way. Turn that way. Are you confident that the line you're on now is the line you should be on? Yeah. Are you confident the line you're on now is the line you should be on? Yes. Are you confident the line you're on now is the line you should be on? No. What line do you think you should be on? Oh, what caused you to move to the disagree? <laughs> because I, given listening to the argument of what they said earlier, it fuels my belief on this question a bit more. Because at the end of the day, wokeness it's the idea that I feel like can be very subjected to people's understanding of what the word is. And people's understanding of the word wokeness can be scrutinized and can be radicalized easily. And I feel like if we put ourselves into a position where we don't do proper research or understand how people approach to certain issues and words, then we would definitely we have a hard time progressing as a society. So was it one of the arguments that they made when they were on that side that caused you to move? I think it, where someone mentioned about the importance of awareness, I think if we continue, to, I feel like wokeness is a more, is a word that tends to be used in a way that tends to bring fear into people. 
And although we live in a society where we're constantly calling out people mistakes, at the end of the day, the goal is to make people aware. And sometimes people may have abused the, that term. But at the end of the day, the cause is still there. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, cool. I don't think that clock is working because I'd be astonished if it were 2 o'clock. Let's see. 8.48. Uh, what time do we have the room to, Hannah, do we have the room to 9? Is that where? 9.15. Okay, cool. Um, so that's something else you can do if you do this with classes, kids, you're, if you're a TA, you're med in school. You can ask people to switch lines uh, at any point. W one thing that we haven't done a lot or haven't done that much of is resetting the lines. If you have something that's interesting, you can just reset the line as many times as you want. Okay. Um, so would you, would you say nine, we have this till nine fifteen? Right, well, yeah. Well, well, let's see. And what time is it now? Can we do two more. Can I do one more and then? All right. Let's do one more, and then after we do this one, somebody else will do it. Cool. God is the only objective criteria, it should be criterion, I-O-N, for truth. Uh, who wants to, one, two, well, let's see, we got had you before. Who else? One, we had you before. Who else who hasn't done it? Two, awesome, come on down, come on down. By the way, so why two things? Why they come down? Come on down. Why is it better to have two? Because if they have one, I, you don't have anybody to play off of, right? If, if you just have one, if you have two. Okay, so hard to say who's taller, so just go on the neutral line. You're on the neutral line. Uh, uh, a couple things. Uh, do you remember when I asked that question, was that a deal breaker to you in a friendship? So the, the, one of the things when I do this is my golden rule for asking questions is I will only ask someone a question if I genuinely want to know the answer. So I was genuinely curious if that was a deal breaker to people, especially in 2023. I was hoping that they, they would say it wasn't and that, that they said it wasn't. Okay, so, um, and again, in, in the back, uh, just, you know, w watch, watch the screen. Uh, question, uh, question reason and counter, um, and we're gonna start, which I should have done last time with the definition. So before you go, don't move yet, um, how do you define God? Uh, a non-dependent, pure, existent reality. Okay, how do you define God? I don't know that I've ever like defined God, but probably a pretty typical like Christian sense of God. Omni everything. Sure. Okay. So I just want to make sure I'm clear. Like when, when you say a reality, what do you mean? I mean, I can stick with the typical Abrahamic faith monotheistic God. That's fine too. Oh, okay. But I want to make sure you're comfortable before we, like we have to agree or else the question won't make any right. sense. So you cool, you cool with the omni everything? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So omni everything, you're cool with that? Okay. Okay. Read, I can't see. Ah, no. God is the only objective criterion for truth. Five, four, three, two, one, move. Okay. Oh. <laughs> this is what we live for. Okay. Tell him way down there why you strongly disagree. In my opinion, there is a difference between a fact and a belief. Tell, tell him, tell him. And I think that truth can include either of them, um, but for it to be an objective criteria for truth and for God to be the only objective criteria for truth is not something that I agree with because I would think that things that you experience that aren't necessarily directly connected to God. Like what? Like, e like eating a hamburger. Yeah, or 
speaking to you or standing on this carpet. Um, I don't really need God to say anything about that for me to know that it is true. Okay, so for you, and let me make sure I have this right. For you, it's um, a direct personal experience of something does not have to be mediated by an omni-everything being. Yes. Okay, okay. Okay, so you're going to tell her, not me. Why do you believe God, uh, you strongly agree, God is the only objective criterion for truth? So there are multiple ways of getting to truth, rational method, scientific method, etc., None of those lead to an objective source of truth. The only one is something metaphysical, which would end up being some sort of organized religion, which also goes back to this idea of God. What about math? Math itself, I mean, there's debates on that. Um, then we'd have to figure out, is math a belief or is it a truth? If it's a truth, where is that ultimate source coming from? Is it something that's part of this? I mean, that's why we talked about this omni-everything or non-dependent reality. If God is looked at as this omni-everything, then those mathematical truths are being sourced from him. And not from, not from science, or not from uh, m- uh, math itself, or you know, it's not rationally just understood separately. So I want to, I'm going to take a little extra time to make sure I understand this because it's such a complicated issue. So seven plus five equaling twelve, or make it even. I'm not a math guy, so I'm just going to say one plus one is two. One, <laughs> what a sad statement that was. Um, <laughs> one plus one equaling two. L- l- let's say that there were two universes. In one universe, there was a universe with a God. In one universe, there was a universe without a God. And we didn't know which one we were in. How would one plus one equaling two look different? What, what would one plus one equal in a universe without God. You're saying what would one plus one equal in a universe without God? Yeah. So my understanding and based on the definition of God is that a universe without God, without the source, it's impossible to have any sort of truth in the first place. And because, so that's the part I need to connect, draw a line to that so I can understand that. Why? So if one plus one equals two is an objective source, my whole claim is that God is an objective source for truth. There has to be some sort of standard outside of the reality itself that puts these standards into place. Like the rules have to be sort of set, the rules for engagement, so to speak, right? Why can't the rules for engagement just be definitional? So even definitional truths, if you're understanding the axiomatic truths, well, what makes them true in the first place? So I'm just, I'm sorry, just, 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 just help me a little more. I know I'm a little slow. So axiomatic truths by definition aren't mediated by anything because they're axiomatic. So... The whole idea is, okay, so whether something's definitionally true, we'd say, okay, why, why do we even believe in something like the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction? They're usually defined as axiomatic or intuitively true, right? So those propositions, if somebody just claims that they're true in and of themselves, like, okay, but based, the question would be based on what, based on what? For me, my understanding is that there has to be some sort of non-dependent reality which allows for all these kind of truths to stick Okay, well, one more thing, and then, and then I'm going to try to give it to her just as good as I'm giving it to you. Why could that, l- let's say everything you said was true, or just accept by fiat that it's true. Why couldn't the thing be something other than God, like an infinite regress? Why couldn't there be an infinite regress? Well, why couldn't an infinite regress be the source of truth as, a, as opposed to God? So if... We're assuming that there is some sort of reality that does not have a God, and it, we're trying yes. to presuppose that there is, hypothetically, some other way of ascertaining truths. So using that method, let's just say somebody says, all right, there's a rational method to, uh, to, uh, to, to get to this. Rationally, is infinite regress uh, of causes possible? And then, uh, depending on your philosophical position, one would argue, no, it's not possible. Infinite- but let's say it is. Let's say it is, because I actually believe it is. But let's say it's possible. Why couldn't we use the same method of reasoning uh, an infinite regress is the only objective criterion for truth. Like, because an infinite regress would be grounded in, in it, the, this, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the same method of reasoning could be used, at, but God could be a placeholder for the infinite regress. Uh, if I didn't articulate that clearly, let me know. I'm going to go on to her. Yeah, could you just explain that again? Sorry. Yeah, so why does the thing, the only objective criteria for truth, have to be an omni-everything uh, omni being? Why couldn't it be 
something else that exists? Why, why couldn't it be an essential nature of the reality itself without being in the reality? Like, why, why couldn't it be subspecie eternitatis uh, from the beginning of eternity to the end of eternity? Why, why would you need a kind of anthropomorphized omni-everything being to confer that truth? So I wouldn't, I don't agree with an anthropomorphized version of God. Okay. Um, but the idea is, so you're going back into, if I'm understanding the way that you're explaining it, is that you, to presuppose some sort of reality that can either infinitely just, just be there, that, you know, the sort of God in the gap questions like yeah, yeah. first cause, et cetera, et cetera, like, okay, well, is that philosophically possible or not? So you're, uh, what you were, I guess, uh, positing is that, no, assume that it is possible. I mean, I, I, it would be like me assuming that A is not A, is, is a possibility, right? Law of identity, non-contradiction. So I, I can't, I, it's tough for me to agree with a, you know, rational, axiomatic truth being, you know, possible or impossible. If, if it is like that, if chaos is possible, then there is no truth at all. So the one plus one is two doesn't matter anyway. You're just stepping into postmodern territory like that. Okay. 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 Whew. There's a lot yeah. to keep in your head here. Okay. First of all, did anything he say convince you to move to the disagree? I wouldn't say so, but I also don't necessarily disagree with what he's saying, if that makes sense. Like, I see where you're coming from. Um, it makes sense to me. I think that we are looking at this question kind of on different levels. Um, I, if I understand correctly, I feel like you're taking a more zoomed out view kind of than I am. I, I think so. Would you, is that fair? Yeah, I, I, I think so. So I was kind of thinking more along the lines of, like, let's say God makes us and does not provide an exact script of everything that we say. I could still say something that is objectively true, and that's not something directly from God, even if we're saying that God made me and God gave me the ability to observe that truth. So if, if, if you say, I'm going to touch your hand, okay? Mm -hmm. if, if, if you hold this in front of your face and you say, this is a hand, mm -hmm. your claim, it's a G.E. Moore's claim, your, your claim is that nothing mediates that. There's a kind of immediacy from the hand to the cup here, to the head. And, would, and you don't need, like, any intervene. Yeah. I would say that that's how I see things, yes. Oh, okay, so one more question, and I'm going to go. So, okay, no, I'm not going to ask another question. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still caught up in some of the things you're saying. So, 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 so can I have a touch your hand? Yeah, so, so this is a hand. You perceive that. I assume you perceive that as your hand. Her claim, and if I've mischaracterized this, let me know, is that there's an immediacy between this and she can know that that's true without any kind of div div divine intervention, divine presence, kind of extra supernatural metaphysical reality. How would you respond to that? Tell her how you'd respond. Did I characterize that roughly? Roughly. To tell her what your response to that claim would be. Uh, so I think the way that you explained that, maybe this whole zoomed out, zoomed in, like uh, yeah, yeah. way we're explaining, I think that's probably the issue. Yeah. So yeah, if somebody, you know, me or you believing our hand is our hand, like we're perceiving it in first person perception and intuitively, I know that. And a person, you can imagine, an atheist who doesn't believe in God also says, like, yeah, I don't need God to tell me that I have a hand or I exist or one plus one is two or anything like that. The, the reason I was zooming it out is to say, yeah, that ability for you to say and make that objective claim needs to be sourced somewhere. If it, if it is not some sort of non-dependent reality that allows us to make these objective claims, then we are defaulting to what ended up happening with the Enlightenment and everything else, and just end up in a postmodern phase where, no, everything then becomes subjective because all I can really know is my own perception. Maybe this is a hand, maybe it's a guy's hand, maybe it's a girl's hand, maybe I'm fluid, who knows what I am. Wait, 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 I like? Why did, I, I, I'm just caught up on this. I'm, so maybe because I've done this for 12 hours today, but why does it have to be sourced? Like, I don't, I'm missing that. Draw the, help, help me figure okay. that out. So I'm a fundamentalist, right? Meaning that if you don't have a grounding for where your truth claims are coming from, then 
There's no scaffolding, so then there is no truth. Oh, you're saying you are a fundament. You're a truth fundamentalist. Yeah. Okay. And that fundamental bottom of the the, the pyramid, so to speak, or the triangle goes to some metaphysical reality, which I'm naming right now as God. If the, so the claim is God is the only objective criterion for truth. Let's do this. Let's reset. Um, oh, Reed, you just took it away. <laughs> ah, yes. Truth... You know, think in your head who I'm asking this for, right? Don't move until I say move, please. Truth requires a fundamental grounding. Five, four, three, two, one, move. Okay. Now I'm confused. <laughs> why, why did you stand on the slightly agree for truth requires uh, a grounding, fundamental grounding. Tell them, uh, tell, tell him actually. <laughs> because, I mean, some things are not true. You can lie and that's obviously not true. And some things are true and also not true. Like if I believe something is true, like say I'm, experiencing psychosis and I say something and I'm like there is a dragon over there and to me that is true but to everyone else like that's not true so I would say that it does require a fundamental grounding but it's not going to be the same for everyone all the time okay. which is why I slightly agree. okay hold hold on why wouldn't the fundamental grounding be reality? Because I think, like you were saying before, you know, you are perceiving your hand. You have to experience things through your brain. So... So that would be reality? To you. Okay, if I told you I saw a massive rhinoceros up there, uh, <laughs> so you don't see a rhinoceros up there, right? Correct. Okay, so the fact that you don't, so there's no convergence of opinion if I asked everybody to vote on if there's a rhinoceros up there. So we, we, we would achieve the consensus based upon, the rea based upon reality. Well, if you really saw a rhinoceros up there, like if you meant that when you said that, then that would be true to you. Like it would true, be true, true, true to you. Right, right, right. We say it'd be true to me, but it wouldn't be objectively true. It would be objectively true that you see a rhinoceros up there. Do people have their own truths? In that case, you would. It would not be objectively true to say there is a rhinoceros up there, but it would be true for you to say, I see a rhinoceros up there. If I tell you seven plus five is... F if you have two people, one says seven plus five is 15, and one says seven plus five is 27, is someone wrong? Yes. And how do we know someone's wrong? They were both wrong. But how do we know someone is wrong? Because you can count. So in matters of fact, must someone be wrong? Not someone be right, but in matters of fact, must someone be wrong? If two people have conflicting beliefs about the same objective phenomenon, and a matter of fact, must someone be wrong? I think that that's fair to say. I think that in matters of perception, that it's more based on your own personal truth. But in matters of fact, I think it's fair to say that someone could be wrong. Okay, so we'll, we'll wrap up pretty quick because I want to make sure someone has an. Do you have a good question? Yeah, Our question. Um, I, I was wondering. I don't know if we're allowed to ask questions, but um, it's a free country, son. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> well, if you if you're in this situation, let's say there's only five people on Earth, and they're all experiencing uh, group hallucination, they all see the rhino there. There's no the convergent point of view is that the rhino is there, and there's no conflicting point of view. What in that case would be? Well, some someone so so some so some some somebody in. In that case, someone would still, there was either a rhino there or there's not. 
Well, what if everyone saw a rhino? Everyone who exists. Right, and so there was rhino. either a rhino there or there's not. Okay. And true, so truth isn't a matter of consensus or vote, right? It's a matter of fact. And that's why I was curious about the, the claims from initially uh, if the fundamental grounding, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'll put words in your mouth. So your argument to the initial claim was that the fundamental grounding had to be something outside the reality itself, like a metaphysical entity or realm or what have you, that conferred the, um, the, the ability to have true or false in the first place. Correct, yeah. Right, and absent that grounding, we wouldn't have truth or falsity. Correct. Okay, cool. So, uh, all right, good. I'm, I want to get one more in, or I would normally ask a few more questions. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Good guy. Good job, everybody. All right. Uh, we have time for one more. Uh, what's the next one, Reed? Equity is a worthy goal. One of my favorite topics. Um, who wants to participate in equity is a worthy goal? Or you want to participate? Come on down. Come on down if you want to participate. We need come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Come up. Oh, we had. We had, Let's see. We got. Come on. Okay. Five. Come on down. One, two. Good. Good. Because one of you is going to do it. Okay. Hold on here. Let me get a pen. Um, yeah, we got to find a facilitator. Okay. Okay, who wants to facilitate? Raise their hand. I think he should. I think he's pretty. He's a high level thinker. Who wants to facilitate? You want to facilitate? All right, I was going to write a random number down. But, okay, here you go. Okay, so, so before we do this, I want you to do the whole thing, including the rules. So if you ever do this on your own, I want you to remember the rules. So, it's, you know, don't do this. Uh, and make sure everybody moves at the same time. Line everybody up by height. Ask them why they try to keep it moving. If you want, look behind you. Uh, if you forget the claim, that goes for anybody. Uh, Reed can also give you hints and stuff if you want a, a place to go with this. Reed? Yeah, that's Reed right yeah, there. Look for, look for the yeah, look, look for the orange to, the, to reset it. If people go on different uh, 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 lines, uh, make sure they speak to the person across the line. Got it? Uh -huh. You can do it. I'll help. I'll jump in if it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, and make cool. sure you hold this like this. Today. Got it. So line them up in terms of height. We'll okay. do the whole thing. You're the boss. It's muted. Is it? Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, so uh, I think we have to do the line up and all that stuff first, right? Okay. Yeah, so the, you do, make sure you do the definitions too. Okay. Clarifying what we mean by equity, are we referring to equity within the realm of ideas or race or Put them on the lines. Do, do that. Yeah, okay, let's go on the lines. Is it by height? Let's see. So it's tossed in the back, right? Tossed in the back or the front? In the back. In the back, yeah. Get out of the way. Okay. Tossed in the back. Okay. So before we start, we want to clarify the definition of equity. Is that what we're trying, trying to do, right? That makes sense. Okay. Um, should I provide one and see if they agree, or should I try to feed it, get it from them? Uh, get, get it from them. Get it from them. Okay. I think you were mentioning something, right? Yeah. Um, Put the microphone up to him, up to his mouth. I think it'd be more interesting to, uh, to have us answer with regards to both equity, with regards to things like race, as well as equity with things like ideas. So I think it'd be best to keep it broad and allow both topics to happen. So already you're saying that equity has a different meaning when it comes to race versus, uh, what was the other one you said? You said race and? Or versus like ideas. Versus ideas. So you're saying that there's a different definition for, e for both? The word equity has the same definition in both cases, but so I think yeah, though- I What think, is that? Um, equity, uh, uh, rather than, I guess, having equal outcomes. So like, let's say you have 10 voices in a room, allowing all 10 to be heard equally, not based on their merit, but just 10% of the time, 10% of the time, 10% of the time, 10% of the time. So quantitatively equal, does that mean equality or equity? That would be equity, I believe. And then equality would be starting, like if you're all starting a race, starting at the same starting line would be equality. And then equity would be, would be if you all finish at the exact same time. Does that make sense? So you're talking about uh, outcomes, right? equality of outcomes 
Verse. I would define equity as a quality of outcomes and equality as a quality of your starting position. Opportunities, right? Okay. So going equality, opportunities, mm-hmm. yeah. equity is outcomes, yes. right? Everybody okay with that one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're good? Okay. <laughs> okay, so they're all standing the way they should. We got a definition. Remember, you can't be in the middle of stuff. You have to go to a line. Wait till I say five, four, three, two, one. That's the idea? You got it. Okay. All right. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay. Uh, where to start now? Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. <laughs> okay. And just to make sure, we're saying excellent. Equity is a worthy goal. And you strongly disagree with that. You disagree with that. You're neutral. And you agree that equity is a worthy goal. I think you were up here before. Did you start last time, or I can't remember where you started? Doesn't matter. I usually go to one of the ends. One of the ends. Yeah, okay. So equity, equality, oh. Equity meaning equality of outcomes is a worthy goal. You do not agree with that. You strongly disagree. Yeah, okay, so why, why so? What's your evidence? Because not everyone is equal in their ability, and not, e- every, not everyone is equal in the amount that they put in, the amount of skin they put into the game. Not everyone is going to be working 70, 80 hours a week to get ahead. Not everyone has equal levels of intelligence. It's as simple as that. We're in, in terms of, in, should we have, all have equal rights? Of course. But do we all have the same equal ability? No. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't draw back from those who have extraordinary ability and give um, pedestals to those who do not. Okay, so if I understand you, you're saying that because people have different temperaments, different skills, some people are better at certain things than others. Because of that skill set that someone does or does not have, that's going to lead them to certain outcomes. And if I'm better at something, like I'm better at certain types of jobs that earn more money, then I'm going to earn more money. Somebody who doesn't have that same skill set, they shouldn't be able to earn as much as money as I do because they don't have that same skill skill set. Correct. correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, keep going. Yeah. Okay. So is there anything you agree with him, like same style or something different? Um, yeah, very, very similar. I would, I would agree with uh, most of what he said. Like I believe in a meritocracy. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I mean, he, he didn't elaborate on that, but one big factor in this was just like, uh, in my opinion, or at least the, the data that I've, you know, I've seen, because it's kind of a broad swath, that like giving everyone the same – will actually lower the, the standard of whatever that is, um, the efficiency um, versus letting the cream rise to the top. Um, I wouldn't, yeah, almost everything he said I, I agree with, but I, I do always like to position myself a little more uh, in, in the middle because I do recognize like certain subjects, like for me it's a little different. Some subjects I think like equity is like uh, having a, that equity my mindset is is good and then some is not like you know I, I think some some factors really are a disadvantage uh more than other factors um so i do like to you know for example like disabled people it doesn't you can't really argue that they have the same ability it's literally baked in you know with that label so i don't i think they shouldn't be just left to the curb so i would go to that strongly disagree but everything he said i would stand by. but they don't deserve the things that the most able-bodied people who are highly intellectual, like that person and a disabled person don't, shouldn't get the same outcome. Um, say, say that one more time, please. So we were saying you were giving examples of that. There's clear skill differences, which he mentioned too. Yeah, yeah. One extreme example is somebody who's, let's say, physically or mentally disabled, yes. right? Or they have a, uh, some sort of illness or impairment or mm-hmm. something like that. Now, if you have somebody who, let's say, fully, you know, have whatever they have men- mentally, sure. physically, able-bodied or like cream of the crop, mm-hmm. so they're able to attain a lot more in life. So you're saying that that person who's intellectually amazing and a disabled person should not, there shouldn't be something pushing them to give them the, both the same thing, um, outcome-wise, I mean. I would say economically, like, I, I could be more nuanced with that. I don't know if that, that's exactly what you're asking, but, like, like, for example, culturally, like, I think a disabled person should be, there should be a, that, that equity quotia in the sense that, yeah, they're just as important as... Uh, LeBron James, but economically, no, or, you know, uh, in other aspects of society. So um, I don't think, yeah, a disabled person would uh, deserves the same as, uh, you know, the top performer of any field, but I think they should be respected as such. So I don't know if that counts in the equity. So maybe like a bare minimum? 
No, I think beyond the, I mean, that, again, I don't know what, what a bare minimum is. I think a standard of living, um, what's the term, uh, dignity, you know, that's hard. Again, definitions are hard to define, but no, I don't think they should have subsistence. Uh, I think they should be um, able to enjoy their life uh, as much as we can, we can provide. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. But I don't think they should. They necessarily deserve. We don't deserve. I don't. I don't think we should hurt the economy or the you know society aggregate to make them be exactly the same. Giving like a yacht or something just for just for being disabled. But I definitely think they should have the means to live a dignified life. That's funny. I was thinking of a yacht in my mind too. I was like, you want to give it? Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know why we jumped to that right away. No yacht. Okay. So. Yeah, you are neutral. Uh, yeah, explain that. Okay, so with regards to some things, I think equity is useful and good, and with regards to others, I think it is uh, not useful. I would say, I'm with regard to basically everything he said, uh, I agree with, but I think that the place in which the help for individuals who are disabled uh, should come from is within the community they're embedded in. I think that's a much healthier way to go about it versus like mandating it from like a gun-to-the-head government level. But the reason I'm staying in neutral is because I, f I feel that in the realm of ideas and academia, equity is important. So I don't necessarily, uh, w with regard to just hearing different ideas, I don't think that they should be less or more heard based on their uh, merit necessarily. I think it's important to give an equal field with regard to ideas specifically. Uh, uh, equality. So like I said earlier, if you got 10 ideas, I don't think the best idea should get 90% of the airtime and then the other nine share 10%. I think each should get 10% of that airtime. So for example, like if you're hiring prof professors, I think it would be, even if let's say we came to the conclusion one specific, and, and many people do come to this conclusion, one specific political affiliation is superior to the others. And then you start hiring based on that. I think that's problematic. I think it's important to keep a wide range of ideas. So if, let's say, a host of a session got more airtime than the participants, is that a good thing or a bad thing, like in terms of equity? Um, uh, I would say that's probably a bad thing. Uh, it would depend on the situation. Like if the participants ran out of stuff to say and the host continued talking because that was their job, then that would just be a result of the circumstances. But I think as long as there's something to say, I think it's important to give equal time to ideas. So if, let's say, you have people with clear intellectual differences, which you agree with, right, what they were saying, that there are people with different skill sets, you have somebody, let's say, PhD expert in their field and has been doing research for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and then you have a bunch of people who are bachelor students, do they all deserve the same space to explain their ideas on the same subject? Yeah, but I think it's also important to contextualize what they're saying. So um, if there's no PhD, let, let, let's say you got one subject with the, the PhD uh, individual and one with the grad student individual, um, then yeah, I think they should get equal time. But I think it's also important that you acknowledge where they're at in their careers. Now, it'd be better to have two people who are on equal footing just for the sake of the quality of whatever debate you're in, but I do think it would be important to give them equal time. So yeah, this hypothetical example is that you have people at extreme sides, literally like student and master, that kind of idea. In most other regards, like I mean, we have martial artists over here, right, and a student over there. So should the students have equal time in, let's say, doing moves, or should he take time teaching them, which is obviously going to take more time? Oh, well, okay. So I was referring to in reference of uh, the sharing of ideas to begin with. So if you were to take two teachers. So, so he's a master at what he's doing. He's got to, I'm assuming, right? <laughs> so he's got to explain his ideas. And if he gives equal footing to all the other students that are there, is that actually going to work? Because it's, um, it's a sharing of ideas on what's the best technique and this and that. If everybody else jumps in and says, well, this is my idea. This is my idea about the best whatever, I don't know. The, what do we do, BJJ, right? Okay. I don't know, take down or whatever, best way to grapple, get out of it, like, does that, is that, does that make sense? Would you, something you agree with? Well, I think in that situation, um, uh, okay, let me restart. So he's in the situation, the teacher, and he's got students. I think each student, in reference to each other student, should have equal time. But he, as the teacher, these students are paying, I would assume, for his class. Now, if there was, it was a situation where there was two teachers, and it was marketed as there being two teachers, and both had equal amount to say on this subject, 
even if they had different points of views, then I think in that situation it would be important to allow both of them to speak. Okay. Is there? No, she did the. Go. Okay, let's do before you do that. So check out what Reed put on the back there. Now you have some choices. So, uh, but before you do it, you should definitely do him quickly. So make sure that he, it, at the very least, that that he gets heard. But so you have some choices. You can either walk to the guy on the agree line and ask him, should creationism have equal airtime as evolution in elementary schools? Or you can ask him some other insane question to try to get him to assent to it. Yeah. And then relate it back to whether or not that's equity. So you can do that or you have a choice. But it, either way, you have to go to him next because he hasn't spoken yet. Or you can reset the line you can put everybody on the neutral again to one of those things up there, to one of the three things. Because that those were three things that people said during the discussion. Three yellows, you mean, right? Correct. OK. All right, so let me do it for you. OK. <laughs> How you doing? Yeah. Um, I'll face the other, and face the cameras. Yeah, right. yeah. OK. So now you, for him, you want me to try to use one of those, or just get his ideas first and then push one of those questions? Um, I, would, I would jump to that. So this is if I would. So you're the boss. You can do what you want. But I would jump to the. I would jump to the creation as a question and relate it to evolution, um, or I would just said, "Why do you believe that?" And then I'd reset. Okay, and you said I can either use that one or use another sort of yeah probably one. Okay, uh, do you think that when let's say in public schools they teach about the horrors of the Holocaust and World War II Nazism, should they give equal time to teaching the positives of Nazism and fascism? <laughs> you like that? <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, uh, I didn't really think about that question in my free time, but if I have to... Can you repeat your question, please? <laughs> uh, I mean, if I'm going to oversimplify it, should racists and anti-racists both get the same airtime, let's say in public school, where normally it's an anti-racist institution. I mean, it's debatable, obviously, but let's just say that we're taking that as an assumption that they're teaching a certain ideology, racism's bad, fascism's bad, that kind of stuff. Should the pro side of that also be taught? Pro-racism or pro-fascism, things like that. Um, that is a very great um, answer because it can't really be a black and white, but I would say that yes, in a sense, based on its approach of how you present this topic, if you present it in a more objective way, in a sense of how it's been brought throughout history, if you're going to simply disenfranchise an entire piece of history or, or like experience, then you're going to encourage students to explore it in a way that is not healthy. And that's why we get to some of unfortunate disaster that, I see, that we see in today's society, where we see people not research in a way they should have research in school and how certain information are not being presented in a way that is being taught. So if you're going to get history in a way that's good history, also present the bad history as well. Because at the end of the day, you should trust what, how you're teaching it. Because if you're trying to aim for a particular side, then you're not really showing or presenting the history of what's happened. OK, okay so we've got a, we've got a cut because we're on uh, a time. But the, so, so the last two questions you would ask if we had time were, um, uh, is there anything I should have asked that I didn't? Or even one more, you know, what would it take you to move? And then like, you, you'd ask, you'd go over here and you'd ask him, um, wh you know, what would it take for you to move one line? And you'll, you, you know, you'd see what he'd say, and then you'd see if the other person can give it. And then you so for him too. There's no one on strongly agree. So you'd ask him what would it what would it take to move you? And then the final question you'd ask, and I'm curious, I'm going to ask for you. What line do you think he'd be on? <laughs> I don't know where you're pointing. I can't tell. <laughs> I think I'd be on disagree. You don't have to answer that if you don't want to. Oh wait, no, hold on. Equality of outcome is a worthy goal. I'm gonna guess where you'd be. Okay, uh, yeah. I I think you'd say either, I'd say you'd probably say disagree or maybe strongly disagree. So I think that the definition has to be 
beat down a little bit more. Yeah. Because if you say something like happiness, it's yeah. a very vague sort of goal, then fine. I think most people would agree. Yeah, everybody deserves and they should get some level of happiness. Yeah. But when you start going down to specifics, like, okay, what, what makes me happy is, is a yacht or two yachts or whatever. Like, okay, yeah. hold on. Getting into that requires a bit more, let's say, skill set, et cetera. So no, 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 I don't agree with that necessarily. Okay. Okay, cool. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We are uh, wrapping it up. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, did everybody get something out of this tonight? Do you see how you could use this in a wide variety of, of sources and contexts? Um, so we live in a country, in a society at this particular time where people simply are not talking to each other. They're not speaking across the divides. And much of the time, is they just don't know how to do that. Um, I set out a little template in the beginning. You listen, repeat something back to somebody, ask them if you have I understood this correctly. Um, one thing, this, so this is kind of a scale. So one thing you can always do if you don't have a physical scale, you can just say to someone, hey, on a scale from one to 10, I love this, I use this constantly. This is unbelievably helpful. On a scale from one to 10, how strongly do you believe in that? With one being, I don't believe at all, five being maybe, seven being, yeah, I'm pretty sure, and 10 being, I'm absolutely positive. And if someone says, I don't like the scale or I don't wanna use the scale, then that's cool. Just don't, don't force it or don't push it. One of the key things is you never wanna create adversarial relationships because people change their beliefs in the, when, when they feel psychologically comfortable and psychologically safe. So someone doesn't wanna use the scale, or you can say, okay, you don't like you know, one to 10, let's use one to 100, or uh, I actually had a guy say, I will only use an alphabetic scale. <laughs> okay, great, A to Z, it was A being, that's, that's fine too. Um, okay, so you can basically ask them to put it on a scale, they put their beliefs on a scale, ask them what it would take to change their minds. Um, Speaking across the divide isn't particularly complicated. I mean, I just gave you a very, very, very brief uh, overview of the first two chapters of the uh, seven in my book that, but it should be enough to get everybody going and it should be enough. So if you're a professor, you can use this. You don't need the carpet, you can just use tape. Or if you have kids or, um, I use, use a version of this with my own kids and I think they, they turned, I think they turned out pretty well. Um, okay. So thanks to the AHA Foundation, and thanks for Hannah for hosting us. I appreciate it, Alex. Thanks for your help, and thanks, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be around hanging out for a few minutes if anybody wants to chat, and I appreciate everybody coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>